Welcome everyone uh, as chair of the communication department here at Mississippi University for Women. It is my great pleasure to introduce the 2024 Mississippi Humanities Council Teacher of the Year for the W, Dr. Melissa Smith. Dr. Smith is professor of communication and holds the Gibbons Chair in Journalism here at the W. She joined the faculty at the W in 2011, having previously taught at Mississippi State and the University of Alabama. Prior to joining the academic ranks, she worked as a reporter and in various editorial roles at newspapers in Alabama and Mississippi, and her feature stories also appeared in various magazines. Then she transitioned to television news as a producer at ABC 3340 in Birmingham. After years of working in print and TV news, she earned a master's and PhD in communication at the University of Alabama. Dr. Smith's primary research focus is political communication. In addition to her publications in academic journals, she has also presented her research at regional, national, and international conferences. And she has published three scholarly books. Her most recent book, Third Parties, Outsiders, and Renegades, Modern Challenges to the Two-Party System in Presidential Elections, was published in 2022. Dr. Smith teaches courses on mass communication, digital culture, and media writing, including storytelling for media. Following Dr. Smith's lecture, uh, Dean Amanda Clay Powers will present the Teacher of the Year Award on behalf of the Mississippi Humanities Council. And now I welcome Dr. Melissa Smith to present her lecture, Storytelling, The Journeys of Three Jessicas. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, and I thank you for coming today. I would like to begin by stating that I'm very humbled by this award because this university has a lot of talented and just passionate teachers, and I find that very motivating. And I'd also like to thank the Mississippi Humanities Council for recognizing good teaching at all of the institutions in the state, and it's nice to be a part of that. I have to say this is not what I thought I would end up doing as a career. When I was young, my mother famously said, she's going to be a teacher. And I was like, mm, I disagree. And that was because I loved literature. And I just loved how I could read these stories and they would transform me from the really small community I grew up in in Alabama. I would, basically, that's what I would do in the summer. I would go to the library and I'd get books and I'd bring them home and then I would read them in a week and then I would go back to the library again. So. I thought that all stories came from the amazing imaginations that people had because that's what I was accustomed to. And I wanted to tell those kinds of stories. When I was in high school, I started working at the daily newspaper in my town. And I have to say, I was what was called the newsroom secretary at that time because that was the terminology that they used. But eventually, they let me start actually writing stories and telling stories about people. And I loved it. And these weren't people who were well known. Some of them weren't even very nice. I'm just going to be honest. But I felt like doing stories about individuals like that afforded them a type of dignity that all people should have. And so I think that's when I realized that basically, there are two types of storytellers. There are those who tell the stories that come from their wonderful imaginations, and then there are those who tell stories about real people. And I was destined to write about real people. And my students will tell you that I'm rather passionate about storytelling. Probably if they had a dollar for every time I just stopped in the middle of class and said, let's talk about storytelling and why it's important in the media, their wallets would be a lot thicker than they probably are right now. But I think the stories about people are important because they remind us of who we want to be, of who we are, and maybe who we've been before. And I think in that way, they can help us to understand our interactions with people and how that influences who we become. And so in short, I think we can learn a lot from stories about real people. So true to form today, I'm actually going to be telling stories of three people. And they have nothing in common, except they have similar first names. They're all W graduates. And I learned something from each one of them. 
I will add that all of them said that it was okay for me to talk about their stories today. So the first Jessica came to us as a junior college transfer. Just parenthetically, if you taught for a while, you remember those semesters where you had like two Jessicas in every class? It was kind of that phase. Well, this Jessica was tall and she was sassy. And most important to me, she enjoyed writing. And although writing is necessary for communication, students, you would be surprised how few of them actually enjoy it. But Jessica did. And so I watched those students carefully because I'm the advisor for the student newspaper. And no surprise, she eventually became editor of The Spectator. And she really seemed to enjoy coordinating a staff. And she had good ideas and she was smart. And it was a while before I realized I was seeing some things that didn't add up. She was re-wearing the same clothes from the previous day that I would leave Cromwell and she would still be there really, really late at night. And I finally realized she was living out of her car, which was parked outside Cromwell. And it's not easy to initiate that kind of conversation with a person, and I wrestled with that. And so I finally talked to her about it. And she said she was on the outs with her family and this was a temporary situation that she was in. And it was okay, she said, because she was using the showers in Cromwell that are there for the theater department. And she had a coffee maker in, in you know, the spectator office, and she was good. So it didn't bother her nearly as much as it seemed to bother me. But I also found she didn't really have any money. And so I helped her apply for and get SNAP benefits so she could actually go to the store and buy food to put in the microwave up in the spectator office and coffee to use in the coffee maker. And she had a friend who apparently changed out like the snacks in vending machines. And when they take those out, I guess they're supposed to like throw them away, but that person saved them. And I don't know if Barry remembers, she brought in this humongous box one time of snack foods and she shared them with everyone, but she was, she was okay with being in the spectator office and eating her snacks and drinking her coffee. So, you know, she just, held it together and she kept moving forward and eventually she started living with someone out near the Alabama line and she got more stability in her life but in 2016 she came to me and told me she wanted to apply for something that the Obama administration was planning to do the next semester it was hosting a White House college reporter day and 50 journalists, college journalists from around the country were going to be invited to attend the event and she wanted to apply. And I said, go for it. And I think we were both really surprised when she was chosen because that means she was the one person out of the state of Mississippi who was chosen. And so we were just like, yeah, this is great, this is fun. And then we realized, oh, we have to get her to DC and we have to put her in a hotel and she has to eat. And so the university was gracious and helped us with that. And so we got her to DC and she didn't stay in a swanky hotel. She didn't eat at the really nice restaurants. In fact, I think she probably ate fast food the whole time, but you know, it didn't matter to her. She was just soaking up that experience. And as part of what they did during that event, they got tours of a lot of things in DC, but also of the area that the press corps operates in, in the White House. And so as one of the events, they had all of the 50 students, the college journalists sitting like you guys are out there. And then they had an Obama administration official up front and they were asking questions, just like a regular news conference. And while they were sitting out there, President Obama walked in and he was not anticipated to do this. And they were floored. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never been in the room when a sitting president walked in and just started talking to people, right? Um, and I think that one event that she took place in really opened her eyes and it helped her to realize she could do great things. I think when our students come from backgrounds where there's broken families or just poor circumstances, it can be hard for them to dream big. And all they see are the challenges, like these mountains that are in the way. 
But I think this event changed her life because it changed her perspective. She had actually been in the room with the President of the United States, and they talked to him. And this was during her last semester at the university. And I was so proud of her when she walked across the stage to get her diploma. I mean, do you ever feel like it's your kid up there? <laughs> I, I felt like it was my kid, and she made it. And she overcame a lot to get her degree. And so after graduation, she took a job as a newspaper reporter at one newspaper, and then she moved to another one. And then she got a job doing the online content for a TV station in Huntsville. And she'd been there like, I don't know, a year and a half maybe, when a friend told her about a job opening and she decided to apply for it on a whim. And then she got the job. And Jessica Barnett is now the web and social content editor for Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. I know. And so when I see her name on a release from NASA, I smile. That's cool. I like that. And sometimes I even tear up when I look at it because I remember what all she went through to get her degree. And one of the things that Jessica taught me was that sometimes the hardest things for students to overcome, they aren't the physical conditions. It's emotional. It's mental. And it's often rooted in situations that are outside the university. But when given an opportunity to do something that she never dreamed she would be able to do, it jump-started her hope. And that changed her mindset. And I think it helped her to be able to harness her drive and determination. And now she's excelling at something that she truly enjoys. I think sometimes she still pinches herself to make sure it's real. So that was the first Jessica. And next we have Jessie who came to us from a community college in the area. And she came with drive and determination, but she also came with something else. Jessie had just given birth to a wonderful little baby girl named Carmen. And she brought Carmen to orientation, and it's fitting that Bridget is here because I clearly remember at orientation, we were working with Jessie, and Bridget took Carmen and walked around with her, showing off those grandma skills, <laughs> while we enrolled Jessie in her classes. And, you know, Jessie was driven to get her degree. And it is hard enough to get one when you're just taking care of yourself. But when you're also taking care of a baby, you know, it's much harder. And she worked jobs. And she finally settled on a job at a nursing home because it had flexible hours, which was really important to her. You know, not just as a college student, but also as a mother. But it came with some downsides. She would talk to me about how sad she was sometimes about the residents because people would never come to see them. And she would talk to them. Jessie's a talker. And so she would talk with them, and she would sit and, you know, try to make conversation with them. And she said it was especially sad to her when those people died. And folks came in, and they picked up like the personal belongings and things, and she had never seen those people before. And she said that it bothered her because these people cared so little for their loved ones, and she was determined to make sure that her daughter always knew how much she loved her. And I think that really fueled her determination to make sure she got her degree. And sometimes there was no place for Carmen to go when, when Jesse had a class. So we were faced with the question, it's like, okay, do we let Jessie get behind in her classes or do we let her bring Carmen? And we said, bring her. So this, you know, you've probably been there, you've, you've had that decision. And I think Carmen also made appearances at study sessions, group projects, other, other things, but nobody seemed to mind. We kind of looked at her as an honorary communication student, a bit young, but you know, we're recruiting earlier and earlier these days, right? Yeah. And in my classes, deadlines are pretty important because we like to get them in the mindset of meeting deadlines because it's really important in the media. You have to make your deadlines. Everybody knew when I was working in the media, you don't call me on deadline because it's like, I can't talk to you. Goodbye. So I was always really sticky about deadlines in my classes. And Jesse made most of them, but sometimes they were hard. 
I am pretty sure that all those times Elliot came to me and asked for an extension for the class on an assignment, Jesse was behind Elliot coming to talk to me because I think she felt like Elliot would probably get a yes out of me and always did. So, And so she kept it going. She was working and she was taking care of her daughter and she, she was just pushing through and she made it. And once again, I felt like standing and cheering as she walked across the stage because I knew how important it was for her to get her diploma. Now, I also knew Carmen was somewhere in the building and she was going to find her and take and show her, look what Mama did, you know. <laughs> and I don't think I'd ever seen her smile as big as I did on that day. She was just so happy. So Jesse Smith taught me a lot about the determination of parents to do better for their kids and to make life better and to get out of a cycle that has a lot of families in poverty for generations. And I always think about Jessie when I have a student who is a single parent. And because of her, I learned that it's okay to be flexible on deadlines, you know, especially with someone who is working or has a family. I'm prone to make those extensions for them because life is harder for them, and I want them to succeed. And the last Jessica also came to us from a community college. And I'm going to say she had been woefully unprepared for college by her high school. And when I say woefully, that's probably not a strong enough word. She apparently went to a high school where they did not even think that their students would ever entertain the notion of going to college. But apparently they never met someone as determined as Jessica. And I got to say that I had my doubts initially about whether she would be able to make it. She would take these basic classes and she would either fail or she would drop them just before, you know, that, that bad grade would happen. And it really frustrated her because the one thing that college students find motivating is I'm going to graduate at this particular time. I've got this year. It's going to happen. And with her, we just, we didn't have that. It was a while before she started making real academic progress toward her degree. And she told me later that she didn't have anyone to talk with about her college courses because she was a first-generation student and her family had no idea what she was going through. And I had also been a first-generation student and so I understood that loneliness that you can have, that feeling that nobody, I can't talk to anybody, nobody else knows anything and I don't really wanna ask questions. And so I became that person for her. And she would come to my office and she would sit and, you know, we would talk about classes and we would talk about what she was going to do and, you know, she would share how she was feeling about things. And um, she was very excited when she would make it through courses and she was very sad when she didn't. But she kept going and she was also working a job while she was doing this, but she kept it all together. And she started making progress. I'm not sure she even knew what she wanted to do with her degree. But she just knew it was really important that she get one. That was what was important. She wanted to show other people that she had done it. And she wanted the experience of walking across the stage with her family in attendance so they could see what she had done. And so we worked really hard to get her to that point. And I cried when Jessica walked across the stage and got her diploma. I know they tell us not to do it, but I clapped. And I think I also thank God under my breath because I'm pretty sure she got some divine help along the way. And after graduation, she held a number of different jobs. She also established her own t-shirt design company. And it kind of seemed like she was bouncing around doing sales and things until she could figure out what it was she wanted to do. And then it happened. She was hired as an admissions counselor for the University of Alabama. And she was very excited about this because she knew what she had gone through. And eventually they asked her to do speeches and they helped her get more self-confidence. 
and then they let her stay, take the stage at recruiting events, and she really enjoyed it. And so in January of this year, as in like last month, she began a new job at the University of Alabama. She is now the program coordinator for academic partnerships with HBCUs and the university. And her goal is to get more diverse and minor minority students into STEM programs. And she said that when she interviewed for the job, she told them she wanted to build a bridge to college for students such as herself and let them know that they can do anything if they apply themselves. And I think she's the perfect person for that. I mean, as someone who worked so hard and overcame so much, I, I think she would be great at motivating students who feel they can't go after a goal because they haven't been adequately prepared. And she is walking, talking proof that a determined student can overcome a lot of challenges. And so Jessica Doss taught me to never, ever count out students because they weren't academically prepared. Hard work and determination can go a long way toward leveling the playing field for these students. And I appreciate that. I learned a lot with her. Patience, too. Lots of patience. But those are the lessons I've learned from only three of my students. If you're a professor or you've taught before, you understand that teaching is not a one-way process. It's, I think we become better teachers when we allow our students to teach us some things as well. And I have friends and relatives who think, oh, you just you teach a couple of classes and you go home. And what they don't understand is we have students who have challenges that they have to overcome. And for some of them, navigating college is not an easy feat. There are lots of things that you have to do and they need help with that. And I do think that the personal approach at the W is what separates it from other universities. And yeah, I know it sounds like a sales pitch, but our students really are more than just a number to us. I think for those of us who teach here and enjoy teaching here, we really like that interaction with students and the feeling that you're really helping them achieve something that's super important to them. But because of these three students in particular, I now try to encourage my students to have goals and dreams. I try to be more flexible with assignment deadlines and I try really hard to never count out students who might not have been as prepared as I think they should have been. And my goal is to help students succeed, not to hold them back. They often make me laugh. Sometimes they really frustrate me. And sometimes I'm so sad when they graduate because I don't want to let them go. I know that was the goal the whole time, <laughs> But once we accomplish that goal, it's like, no, you're leaving me. And I think that is a wonderful thing about teaching. But I've also found that some of my students have been excellent teachers as well, like these three that I talked about today. And I appreciate that. Thank you. I can project. <laughs> okay. I can project. So um, I just have something to read from the Mississippi Humanities Council, but I'm, okay. I'm going to give you this. I got a little bit in the mail, but it's, it's okay. okay. Um, the Mississippi Humanities Council is pleased to honor Dr. Melissa Smith for her outstanding teaching here at the W. Every year we recognize a Humanities Teacher Award winner at each of our state colleges and universities. The awardee is asked to present a lecture on a humanities-related subject of their choice, as we heard just now. They receive a cash award and will be publicly recognized for their achievements at the award gala in Jackson on March 22nd. I will be there to see you. Yay. Um, since our founding in 1972, we recognize that Mississippi scholars and teachers like Dr. Smith show the importance of the humanities in creating engaged and informed citizens. At the Mississippi Humanities Council, our motto is the humanities are for everyone, and this is true for both students here at the W, for the people in Columbus, and everywhere across the state. They wrote this for me. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> I'm doing their bidding. The council, and now a pitch for the Humanities Council, 
The Council is an independent, nonprofit organization supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and also by grants and donations from private foundations, corporations, and individuals like you. Now I'm ADR. <laughs> <laughs> um, we create opportunities for Mississippians to learn about themselves and the larger world and enrich communities through civil conversations about our history and culture. We invite all of you to join us in this work, to apply for grants, um, and to come to our programs. Please visit our website or follow us on social media <laughs> <laughs> to learn more about us and our programs. Thank you. Yay. This is wonderful. Thank, Elizabeth, you. thank you so much.